We are Team 11 in Embedded Systems Design at Virginia Tech in the spring of 2013. Our group consists of Martin Overstrom, Chip Senkbell, and Jason Moskowitz. Our task for this class was to build a four-wheeled rover that was capable of navigating a walled course without touching any of the walls. The rover was to stay centered within the course, go straight through intersections, and be capable of uh, taking turns even, uh, even at steep angles. The rover was also required to be able to stop at a finish line, which we chose to indicate with a black line on the ground. The rover was to make a first run through the course, observing its surroundings and saving data so that it could make a faster second run through the course. The rover was controlled completely through an interface on a web browser, uh, which was connected to the rover wirelessly. The hardware requirements for the rover involve several components to make up both the rover and the brain mounted off of the rover. An ARM processor mounted off of the rover provides the majority of the brain activity and the communication and decision making. As it is mounted off of the rover, communication must be done wirelessly through an XP device uh, on the, set up on the ARM side and a second XP device set up on the rover. PIC processors must be mounted on the rover and a saber tooth, a motor controller, will be used on the rover to communicate to the motors. Motor encoders are set up as well to record the rotations of the wheels on the rover. In our setup, the arm is connected directly to the XB. This is handled through UART communication, where the arm will send data through the XB and will be received on another XB mounted on the rover. On the rover itself, we have three PIC processors instead of two. Each PIC processor is designed to handle specific tasks such as sensor data acquisition, encoder data acquisition, and motor controller communication, or bridging wireless UART communication to other PICs. In order to accommodate the close quarters of the course that we are navigating through, we decided to use infrared sensors as our means of navigating through the course with our rover. Specifically, we went with three sharp infrared sensors. One, a long-range sensor, covers a range of 15 centimeters to 150 centimeters. Two other sensors we used, both as well sharp sensors, are short range and cover a range of 3 centimeters to 40 centimeters. Our final sensor was an infrared receiver, which was used to measure reflectivity of objects. In terms of setup and usage, our long-range infrared sensor was mounted at the front of our rover and was used to determine if the rover was moving directly toward a wall. These short-range infrared sensors were mounted at a 30-degree angle from the front of the rover and were used to measure gradual movement towards a wall. The goal of this setup was to provide even coverage of the front of our rover so that we could avoid potential blind spots. Our infrared receiver was mounted below the rover facing the ground. This way, we could measure the reflectivity of the ground and were able to determine when we had crossed the black tape representing our finish line. The master pick's primary purpose is to handle all requests received from the arm and forward those requests via I2C to the other pick processors. As seen in the diagram, this involves intercepting and repackaging messages from UART to I2C and vice versa. Finally, the master pick handles a scenario where communication is lost with the arm. This is done by using a timer to keep track of the time since the last valid packet was received. In the case where the maximum time is exceeded, a stop command is repeatedly sent to the motor pick. The message structure for the wireless messages sent from the arm follows a basic format. The first byte received is called the header byte, which guarantees that the message is synced correctly. Following it are a series of bytes detailing the specific message request. The final byte in a packet is a checksum calculated by exclusively ORing all of the previous bytes together. For a packet to be valid, the checksum received must be correct. One PIC microcontroller board was dedicated to the control of the motors and to acquiring encoder data from the motor encoders. This PIC board operated by taking commands over I2C from the master PIC board. Motor commands received over the I2C bus 
would then be forwarded on to the Sabertooth motor controller uh, over a UART connection. One output from each of the motor encoders was connected directly to an external interrupt pin on this PIC motor controller board. An interrupt service routine was triggered on low to high transitions of the output of the motor encoder. The other output of the motor encoder was then read to determine whether the movement of the wheel is in a forward or backward direction. The motor encoders can trigger interrupts thousand times per second when the motors are moving at moderate speed. The changes in the position of the wheels are stored locally on the motor controller pick. These delta values are then transmitted over I2C in response to requests from the master pick. The sensor pick processor handles retrieving data from our four sensors via four separate analog to digital converters. The sensor pick has a timer running that initiates a specific channel to begin being read. After channel has been read, the data is stored locally and the next channel is selected. Concurrently, the sensor pick processor accepts valid I2C requests from the master pick. And, if the request is for sensor data, the sensor pick will send back four bytes of sensor data packing the proper, proper message format. I, Jason, was in charge of the navigation code. This is where everything comes together in the project. Everyone's work gets showcased here. The rover is finally alive. The navigation code is essentially a large date machine. When the rover sends the arm proximity data, the navigation code uses that data along with its current state to decide what course of action to take. In a simplified flow of the state machine, the rover starts in its start state, where it attempts to go straight. If straight is not an option, it will look for a direction to turn. While the ro rover is going straight, it is trying to stay in the center of the track. When the rover encounters a turn, it checks which turn, right or left, is available and acts accordingly. The navigation code also took care of a special case. When the rover encountered an open area with no sidewalls, it would attempt to go straight. But because of some blind spots in our sensor array, the rover would not see some obstacles until it was too late. To try to correct this problem, when it came to a discontinuity where there are no sidewalls in a portion of the course, the navigation code would have the rover drive in an S-path. This S-path would toggle the areas the sensors are looking at and significantly lessen the blind spots. The rover could then see the obstacles before hitting them. We would keep track of these discontinuities and using encoder data, we could calculate where they end. We would then know how to navigate through it without these S-turns when it came to the optimized run. The rover starts out straight right here until it can't go straight anymore, sees a right turn and takes it, uh, gets into this straightaway and continually tries to stay in the middle in between the walls. Here it gets to a little discontinuity where there are no side walls to path it, so it goes into an S-curve to minimize uh, blind spots uh, and goes right on through, makes that left turn there another left turn here. What it does there is if it gets too close to the wall, it backs up a little bit, tries again. There's no left turn into the final straightaway. Continually recentering. Here's another S turn. Sees an obstacle there. Keeps on backing up until it thinks it can go again. And then it ends on the black finish line. Here, we start our second run. This is the optimized run, where we uh, store values and try to make a more efficient run of the course. We start it again in the straightaway, makes the same turn. And here, since we've already run it once, we already know how to get through this straight away. We don't need to do an S turn again. There's a little glitch there, but it recovers fine. Makes a left turn. Continues going through the course. If 
final straightaway. And again, no S turn here. And stops on the black finish line. Our rover is generally very capable of navigating courses that fall within the design spec. Uh, we perform constant correction to keep the rover centered. Our sensors are constantly checked to make sure that we're within acceptable limits. We're capable of backing up and turning, making more drastic corrective actions when this is necessary. Our infrared sensors are reliable at sensing the distance uh, distances in front of the rover. Our finish line sensor reliably finds the finish line and our rover stops in response to this. However, our design does have some limitations. The fact that our IR sensors are such short range means that we aren't very capable of centering within a large course. While we're capable of driving forward, uh, we're not necessarily capable of staying centered in a course uh, with wider boundaries. We also have no sensors on the back of our rover, so in cases where we are backing up and we happen to be very close to a wall, we may hit the wall uh, not being able to sense it. And finally, while our rover is quite capable of navigating the course without touching the walls, it is quite slow moving. In terms of robustness to failures and changes in the environment, we feel that our final design performs quite well. Our rover will generally run indefinitely through a course uh, as long as it doesn't find a stop signal. Though we previously had issues with radio frequency noise affecting our wireless communications and causing our rover to freeze, we've solved this problem with the use of a new message format which is tolerant to failures in the uh, radio communications. We've also implemented a feature which causes the rover to stop its motion when it loses wireless communication with the arm board in order to stop erratic movement and hitting walls. Some limitations in the robustness of our design include the fact that after we run out of battery power, the uh, rover will inevitably slow down and eventually stop. Low battery power is particularly a problem when we're making tight turns. One limitation on the robustness of our design is the fact that we are very dependent on accurate sensor values. If we were to stop receiving accurate values from our sensors, our rover would surely fail. While our rover performed the requirements well, there are improvements that can be made to boost our rover's performance. The rover currently uses three IR sensors to determine its distance from the walls of the course. This introduced numerous blind spots, which we attempted to remove via software driving algorithms. However, adding additional sensors to provide more data would aid in finding blind spots much earlier without the need for complicated software. Encoder data could be used for the entire course, rather than only with intersections, as we currently do now. We could use this data to determine our position in the course and help decide when to speed up the rover during straighter areas. The receiving code on the master pit for wireless communication can also be improved. Currently, it is not optimized to handle bursts of packets. So, in the case of many packets being received at the same time, the pick has to drop some. If we read our code to handle these bursts much better, we feel like we would have less drop packets and much more responsiveness in terms of the ARM and master pick communication. Hello, my name is Chip Sinko. I'm going to tell you about what I worked on. I worked on the master pick, especially the I2C communication on the master side. I also worked on the sensor pick, including A to D conversions and timing. Finally, I worked on the UR state machine, both on the master on the master pick side and the arm side. Hi, I'm Jason Moskowitz, and I was in charge of the navigation code, as well as interpreting the web server commands. Hello, my name is Martin Overstrom, and I handled the UR communication on the arm board, as well as the web server on the arm board. On the pick side, I wrote the software for the motor controller pick which is responsible for both interpreting motor controller commands and relaying them to the motor controller, as well as acquiring data from the motor encoders and responding to requests for encoder data.